Hello there, I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now today we are looking forward. It's soon to be the new year of the tiger and there's some new music from one of our favorite female rockers. This is Our Vancouver. Coming up, the importance of exercise, any movement, anywhere. And momentum in music with our beloved Biff Naked. But first, marking the Lunar New Year with a modern take on a traditional dish. Hey, it's almost time for Lunar New Year. The Year of the Tiger starts February 1st with family gatherings and, of course, plenty of food. Well, executive chef Roger Ma is back with us from Boulevard Kitchen and Oyster Bar. Roger, hello again. Hi, Gloria. So how has it been for you during the pandemic? I know we checked in with you early on, but uh, how are you coping? Um, you know, just doing the best we can here. Uh, you know, funny thing about the pandemic is actually that's the time I had to come up with this dish that we're uh, featuring today. Okay, well, tell us all about it. Yeah, so I mean, to celebrate the Lunar New Year, uh, I've created a dish, uh, it's a five spice quail. Uh, typically, this is done with uh, roasted squab uh, at a Chinese restaurant. So this is normally a, a banquet dish. Uh, and this is my own take on it. So it's a five spice quail from Decent Farms, which is out in the Fraser Valley. And what we've done is we've made a brine out of all these beautiful spices. We have uh, star anise, some green Szechuan pepper, red Szechuan pepper, clove, cinnamon, uh, some ginger, some dried chilies, and also a little bit of fennel seed. Uh, so the, the quail has been brined for 24 hours, and then we dry it for about seven days. And then after, we use a, a Hong Kong barbecue technique uh, using a really strong vinegar with maltose, and we brush the skin. So as you can see, you get a beautiful sheen on it after it's been roasted. So it's almost like a glass-like texture. It's, just, it's a beautiful, you know, shattering texture in your mouth. Hey, you won an award with that dish at the, the Chinese Restaurant Awards last year, didn't you? I did, I did. And, you know, it, it was a little bit surprising. You know, Boulevard is not a Chinese restaurant, but however, the chef is, you know, Chinese heritage. So I guess kind of there's the connection. And, uh, you know, the inspiration of uh, this dish is actually from my childhood. Uh, you know, it was one of my favorite things to eat going out to a, a Chinese banquet uh, during, whether it's Lunar New Year or a wedding banquet. Uh, usually they serve a roasted squab course. And, uh, you know, everyone will always be fighting for the legs because that was the juiciest part. You know, what I found as a kid, they would, you know, cook it pretty well done. And for me, uh, I like it a little bit medium rare medium. And that's been able to recreate it here at the restaurant. Oh, lovely. Now, you, you actually walk based the duck, right? How, how does that work? Yeah, so basically we take the, the, the bird and then we actually take it out of a uh, with, with tongs and hold it up in the air and we kind of ro roast it with uh, hot, hot oil. So that's what happens to the skin. It kind of seals in all the juices and it gets it really, really crisp. And then after that, we finish it over charcoal to finish the cooking of the quail. And, um, you know, we take it off when it's about medium rare, let it rest to about a medium and then we carve it and then we serve it on the plate. And we're serving it um, during the Lunar New Year. So we're going to be featuring this dish during Lunar New Year with a little bit of roasted beets. Uh, a little potato roasty and also some radicchio and some jam that's been cooked down as radicchio. And then we just finish it with a little red wine jus with a hint of five spice just to kind of get that flavor back from the spices into the into the quail. And it's uh, it's been it's been quite popular. Uh, people come in and they ask for it. And it's a little bit hard to prepare because it, it does take about 10 days, the entire process. So um, it's always on feature. Um, but you know we're gonna run it. We're gonna run for a feature during the lunar year, starting on the first of February. Oh, lovely! Now I'm thinking about all of the time and care that goes into that one dish. I, I so wish you were here in studio with me so I could take a bite. But how would you describe sort of the the taste and texture experience? So the taste. I mean, definitely you get. You know, the moment you the, th the first thing you notice is how crispy the skin is because of that uh, dry aging and also brushing it with the vinegar and maltose. Uh, secondly, when, once you take a, a bite out of it, you'll, you're going to feel the, the glass like texture of the skin and then also the juiciness of the bird. You know, um, the Thiessen does a really good job of raising these quails. Uh, there's a lot of good fat on them. They're super juicy and we cook them to a medium. So 
it retains all that moisture. And then you get the flavor of the Phi Spice. There's lots of umami that comes out and a little bit of the dry age flavor uh, really just intensifies the, the delicate flavor of the quail. And then with the beets and the, and the radicchio, it just kind of cuts through that fat and richness. And also we have a little bit of preserved quince on the plate, you know, local quince that we've cooked and uh, also season a little bit of spice to give it that little bit of fruitiness that, uh, you know, pairs very, very well. Oh, it sounds heavenly. Absolutely heavenly. Okay, <laughs> here we are heading into the year of the tiger. What, what does that represent for you, Roger? Uh, it represents a strong year. Uh, tiger is, you know, obviously a fierce animal. And usually that brings with a lot of good luck. Um, so I think we're going to have a good 2022. Uh, also, it's a special year for me. I'm going to be having a son this year who's also going to be a tiger. So I'm pretty excited about that little tiger boy. Uh, so yeah, pretty looking forward to that. It's going to be a great oh, year. All the best with your new tiger and beyond. A very happy new year to you, Roger. Thank you. Thank you. Gong hei fa Hi, I'm Tyrone and you're watching our Vancouver on CBC. All right, it's time for one of our favorite features. This is where we get to showcase some of the photographs that are sent in by you, our audience. First and foremost, thank you. Well, the fog has been blanketing our region for the past week, kind of eerie and kind of inspiring at the same time. Bindu Mohan took in this foggy scene of the Golden Ears Bridge. Well done. Thank you very much for that. And Sunny Young was downtown last week for a fun walk. That looks just great. Thank you, Sunny. And finally, Fazil Awil woke up early to see the sun kiss the clouds in the sky. Such a gorgeous sunrise. Thank you. Neat to see the stadium in the middle of all that as well. And do send us more. You can email your favorite photographs to us, bcphotos at cbc.ca. It's easy, bcphotos at cbc.ca. Now, BC's entertainment industry has been struggling during the pandemic. But as John Hernandez shows us, while the latest extension of health rules have been hard on them, some owners have managed to keep the doors open by changing up the menu. Mo Tarmohamed is supposed to be getting ready to host a concert tonight. Instead, the lights will be off. It's uh, uh, an emotional nightmare. Uh, compound with, uh, you know, the, the financial uh, repercussions of it. The Rickshaw Theatre has cancelled 20 shows as health restrictions on bars, nightclubs and concert venues roll on. And even if measures do get lifted come February 16th, there is still no telling when he might be able to book an act. It's not like we could just uh, you know, flick the switch on and start having shows again because there's a huge lead time between booking a show, promoting a show. It's a similar story for Darlene Rigo, who owns the popular club and music venue, the Fox Cabaret. At a point, you just start to worry that are they ever l going to let us operate the way that we used to, particularly when the gyms got opened up again. Like, yeah. kind of going, are we that much more of a risk? Technically, these venues could open if they served food. That's what Cabana Lounge owner Dave Kershaw found out when he was reading through the fine print of the latest health order. They didn't reach out to us. It was us. Uh, it was up to us to read the tea leaves, figure it out on our own, and then decide what to do about it. He's been serving food from a taco shop next door and even Domino's Pizza. Last weekend, we sold, uh, I think, 30 large pizzas and some tacos. The Roxy is also following suit, announcing it will reopen its doors tonight. But for most venues, satisfying the meal service requirement is just another hurdle amid a long line of challenges. We've considered it. We even considered what if we could put in a kitchen, but we have been so financially strapped just trying to survive. Um, we haven't had the resources to really take that seriously. A local industry on the brink raising concerns about its long term health. Young people need to get out and have a sense of you know, being in a community, those connections. For most, it's at least another month of closed doors and hoping for the best. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. John, thank you so much for that story. Now, despite the Omicron wave that has swept across the world, a lot of Canadians have been traveling. In December, even while Ottawa advised against non-essential international travel, Canadians were on the move. According to Statistics Canada, 
more than 700,000 Canadian air passengers returned home from abroad. And as Susanna De Silva explains, people are making the choice for a variety of reasons. A brief stopover before a long trip to come. Well, I came from Kranbroek and uh, tomorrow we're going to uh, Amsterdam and then Athens. Don Pontazis missed his annual trip last year, but decided he's waited long enough to see his family. Life now is just like that. We have to live with it and uh, we can put our lives on hold. You know, like uh, we've got to do what uh, we have to do. Figures from December show six times the number of arrivals for the same month in 2020 and more than half the total for pre-pandemic December of 2019. Travel agents say people are traveling for a variety of reasons and some are seeing retirees making many of the bookings. The overwhelming message that I'm hearing from retired people is they're saying, look, we've missed out on two years. This was our plan when we saved up and worked all of those years was to travel and enjoy life. And we've done everything that we need to do. They also have the flexibility to stay longer if they can't meet the negative COVID test requirement to come home. I didn't even think that I would in, the, in a million years that I would get COVID. I was more scared of actually physically being stuck there for like months. Brennan Watson planned to stay in Ireland for a week over Christmas. It turned into three when he tested positive and wasn't allowed to fly home. He says he booked his flight before Omicron. I can lose all this money that I paid for a flight or I can just go and, and risk it. And I decided to risk it. And yeah, I don't regret it at all. His lack of insurance cost him a flight and extra accommodations. And the inability to insure against new border rules or cancelled flights means many aren't taking the chance. What we are seeing is little interest, little business in people planning February reading week breaks, March uh, breaks, or even summer at this point. Because the bottom line is you still can't get trip cancellation. And while the first half of the year is still slow, agents say people are setting their sights abroad for the end of the year. Susanna the Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Coming up, a new study found that during pandemic lockdowns, the temperature of cities actually decreased. Johanna Wagstaff joins us right after the break. So far, science has already shown us that lockdowns due to the COVID pandemic has led to a drop in pollution levels for cities, a short-term drop in CO2 levels, and even a drop to seismic noises. Now, a new study from the Chinese Meteorological Agency has shown the lockdowns led to a drop in temperatures for cities. It all has to do with a decrease in what we call the urban heat island effect. Uh, that's where cities are hotter than surrounding areas, mainly because natural surfaces have been replaced by things that absorb radiation much more readily, like asphalt and concrete. That all adds to a roughly five degree temperature rise in cities uh, in relation to surrounding areas. So this new study looked at 300 mega cities in China during the lockdown and found Found that the urban heat island intensity was reduced 25% during the day and 20% for night. Those decrease in numbers corresponding to a decrease in human activities, less need to heat and cool bigger buildings meant a drop in temperatures. So what does that mean now that we know this bigger picture? Half the world's population already lives in urban areas, and in just a few years, that number could be closer to 70%. These kinds of subtle variations make a huge difference. 35 degrees instead of 40 degrees can mean the difference in multiple de heat-related deaths. So knowing the impact of staying home and reducing urban heat island effect could be a factor in planning for heat domes and heat waves that we know are going to increase with climate change. And Canada has a number of major cities with that urban heat island in effect. And now, your science smart. If you have a science question on your mind, send me a tweet and I'll try to get it answered. Hi, I'm Linda. I'm on Granville Street and this is our Vancouver. Johanna, thank you so much. Well, you are watching our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, if there is anyone who can stay positive and stay productive in a pandemic, 
It's Biff Naked, and Biff is working on a new album. She's going on tour. Biff, it's great to see you. Thanks, thanks for being here, and welcome back. Oh, thank you. It's great to be here. Well, it's good to hear that you're making new music. Uh, we've all been living through some changes, though, but wh where are you right now? So we've been in Toronto for the last couple of years, and as soon as we got here, the pandemic started. Okay, so that how has that affected things? You're you're still staying creative, but that has it affected what you write, how you put your songs together? Oh, definitely. I think that a lot of uh, songwriters or writers or painters um, have been affected by the pandemic emotionally, creatively, obviously financially. If you can't go and physically do your job, uh, but for us, it's been really inspiring, and uh, we've just been kind of uh, stuck shut in uh, into the studio to really tinker and to modify and enhance the stuff that we're already creating. Well, sure. Okay. And how would you characterize the, the new album you're working on to get, compared to your older songs? Um, you know, I hope that I evolve as a songwriter, obviously, every year. I have not put out a studio record uh, in a number of years. And um, for me, this one, it felt like it had to be a champion album. Um, and so the songs are definitely inspiring for me uh, to sing and perform. And they were inspired by a lot of adversity over the last few years. So hopefully people will be able to relate. Well, I'm sure a, a lot of people have been experiencing some tough times. And, and you know, you've always been very, very open about your past, uh, challenges that you've faced, challenges that you've overcome. I, I, how, do you, how do you continue to stay so positive? Well, I think that everyone has a story. Um, basically, we're all, you know, going through the, the lives that we live and just trying to make the best of things and do the best we can. People just want to be happy. Uh, feel feel cared about and be able to um, be able to succeed and what that means is just be able to thrive in life and that's not easy for anybody um, so I always kind of downplay my story um, because I, I always know there's so many people that have a, a more harrowing uh, life of misadventure than I do um, how can we not stay positive I'm always going to be that person that says the glass is half full no matter what um, you know, no matter what is happening, I could be falling, you know, off a bridge. I'm still going to say it's the air is beautiful here. Like I'll always find something uh, good about any experience. I love that. I love that about your posts on social media. Um, they brighten my day personally. Aww, do, do, do you so feel happy. that like what, once you start down that that positive path, do you feel kind of a, an obligation to keep doing that? Because a lot of the feedback that you get in some of the threads is like, thank you, thank you, Biff. Thanks for being there for us. I hope so, you know, and I, I mean, just like anyone else, I have, uh, you know, I'm a human being, I'm very flawed and I'm very, obviously I react certainly to things that are negative. The news is really, uh, sometimes it's really hard, no offense to any newsmakers or news broadcasters, but you know, sometimes when we read the news and it just seems, it seems so daunting and there's just so many challenges for people um, here in Canada and around the world. It's hard to stay positive. Even for me, if I'm having a day where I know that it's just, um, you know, it's kind of depressing or feeling defeating after reading the news, um, sometimes I take a social media day off that day. Good. Um, so it's never going to be forced that I'm going to be positive. But if I take a day off, either I have a headache because I'm a migraine person or, yeah, I just can't, I can't fake it. Good. You're human. You're human. And yeah. people understand that. And I think in many ways that gives others that freedom. It's okay. It's okay. Just check out a little bit. Take care of yourself first. I think that's, that's that, it. it is important. So let's talk about Planning a tour. What's it like planning a tour when you're dealing with restrictions and regulations still in flux? I mean, how's it going? Well, you know, over the last couple of years, we had uh, one tour for Western Canada with a, an American band that was postponed time and time again. It kept getting pushed back by six months, by six months again, by six months again. And it just seemed like it would never happen. Finally, last fall, it did. Last summer, we were able to play a couple shows uh, in the prairies that were festival shows with 
dance like 5440 who we know and the trues and it was just it was really nice to see our our friends and colleagues again but it was short-lived <laughs> and then and here we are and uh you know restrictions are back on um so to be able to come uh to vancouver and, and play at my favorite place the rickshaw um is just a blessing it is a gift i've wanted to get back there since I last played there, which was seven years ago. So this is a really big deal for us. And, uh, and my heart is just exploding. I love the sound of that too. And I, I hear you when you're saying, you know, the ability to be on tour, connect with other musicians, your peeps, you know, it's like, this is what we yeah. love to do. And why is it like when you're actually on stage, the audience is there, you're about to just hit that first chord. What, what do you love about that whole experience of being on stage performing? Oh, it's cathartic. It's so cathartic. I mean, writing songs is very cathartic. It really helps you um, basically express your emotions, whether you're writing a love song or a song about um, unrequited love or, or whatever it is. When you're performing it, it's really um, being able to express that feeling on a million. You know, you can finally let it out. And there's something that's very... Um, enriching about that and not just for the performer but also for the audience right even if you can practice in your living room it's still a limited space and a limited audience i get it okay you get that yeah. instant feedback now what i'd love to <laughs> do right. here i'd love to play a little bit of your your latest song release it's called broke into your car where were you going with this well, ultimately it's a love song it's a song about trying to leave a memento uh for somebody that you're either in love with or have a crush on and uh, in no way is it intended to encourage anyone to break the law. I love being able to touch base with you. All the best with your tour. We can't wait to see you later in February here in Vancouver. Biff, you take great care, okay? <laughs> Thank you, you too. Unspeakable, trying to fear all my feelings. I will stay near, I will keep you up, I will keep you up. Now, as you heard, Biff Naked is playing the Rickshaw Theatre February 18th. I'm not your lover. I'm not your lover anymore. If you're looking for other suggestions, another Canadian singer, Leif Volbeck, plays the Vogue Theatre February 1st. And Kingston's Blackie and the Rodeo Kings play the Commodore for their 25th anniversary tour. That's coming up February 10th. Hey, Grant Lawrence here from CBC Music with a great new tune from an Acadian artist who over the past 30 years has become a legend in Canadian independent music. I'm talking about Julie Doiron, who made history with her first band, Eric's Trip, from Moncton, New Brunswick. She walked close behind me, started to smoke as I slithered along in the dark. And the trees grew up high in the night in the sky as she wondered how far back she Yes, both that video and this shirt goes back 28 years to the mid-1990s. That's Eric's trip from Moncton featuring a young Julie Doiron on bass and backing vocals. And trivia fans, Eric's trip famously became the first ever Canadian band signed to Seattle's iconic sub-pop records. After Eric's trip disbanded, Julie Doiron went solo with a few different projects and found success again when she teamed up with a band called The Wooden Stars. That collaboration won Julie Doiron a Juno Award for Best Alternative Album of the Year in 2000. Please turn off your dance Waiting for you to decide. 
Yeah, that's Julie Doiron and the Wooden Stars with dance music. Over the course of her career, Julie Doiron has also managed to fit in having four kids. And she's worked with everyone from the tragically hip to Chad Van Galen and earned more nominations for another Juno and the Polaris Music Prize on strengths of songs like this one. You got the heart consolation prize for having to survive, having to survive every night, following me in, having to survive. Now you are just friends and people insisted on telling you what a great couple you had been. They insisted on telling. That's Julie Doiron with the great tune, Consolation Prize, that goes back to 2009. Now it's been about a decade since we have had a new album from Julie, but she returned at the tail end of 2021 with a brand new and fantastic full length record that marks her 30th anniversary releasing music. From that album called I Thought of You, here's Julie Doiron with a hand clapping, country tinged, rockin' and rollin' tune all about starting over. It's called You Gave Me the Key. A joyful song for 2022 when we're all trying to start over. That is indie Canadian legend Julie Doiron from New Brunswick with her latest single, You Gave Me the Key. It's currently climbing the CBC Music Top 20, and that's the song that you need to add to your 2022 Fresh Start playlist. I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music. Thanks to Joel Prescatter for the shirt, and hang in there. I'll check in with you again next week. Coming up, teen reporter Sarah Chaudhry interviews a young refugee from Afghanistan hoping to find safety in Canada. Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Well, Canada is offering safe haven to thousands of Afghan refugees, and they are starting to make their way here, including 200 who recently landed in Vancouver. Now, CBC Kids News has been looking into their story, and teen reporter Sarah Chaudhry spoke to a Hazara girl from Afghanistan who is in a refugee camp in Pakistan. Her family is applying to come to Canada. My name is Majid and I live in Koyta, Pakistan. I am Hazara. Hi. Hello. Okay. I'm Sara. Nice to meet you. Hi, Sara. I didn't remember a single thing about the Afghanistan. Uh, nothing at all. What do you like to do with your friends? Um, is there any games that you play? What do you like to do with them? If we will play, my uncle bring for me a game that named uh, Uno. So we, uh, sometimes we are playing that one. I love the game Uno. <laughs> or sometimes we are playing basketball, somehow football, these things. In 
the city uh, in Kuwait that we are living is like a box. In the box, we can't go out of this box. There is a lot of fears, like there is bomb blast and um, a terrorist attack only in the Hazaras people. So uh, sometimes I have friends, if I will be in an, uh, in an in an attack, so what should I do? Like, how should I behave myself? How should I control myself? So fear is a lot. پس این روز در سر خاک هم ده ده اینجه در سر خاک هم مکتبی هم ده اما هم, هم مکتبی هم که در یک حمله انتها در یک انتهایی شهید شدن و ما یال موری در سر خاک شد Why do you like filming videos? Why is filming videos and telling stories about your life meaningful to you? I think that uh, this filming is the way that that I can help um, my people, I can help Hazara people, I can show the world uh, their, pro uh, their problem, that how they are living, how they live in a hard way, like how they are uh, becoming in a bomb blast, like uh, so these things, like showing their problems, that how is their life in Kuwait or in Hazara town. If you come to Canada, is there anything that you really, really hope to do when you're here? Mm -hmm. Yes, in here I want to to study in dear in a very good schools. Like uh, there will be a very good place. Like uh, there will be a very peaceful place. Like there is uh, didn't have any fear. Like I, I didn't have any fear. I will think only about my studies, about my future. I really want to help as other pupils. I want to be their voice. Like I want to be, I want to be the voice that can help them to have a very good, uh, good life. Are you afraid when you are going to school? Or no. For the most part, um, I'm I'm not scared or fearful when I go to school. Um, we live in a pretty beautiful country where um, most people feel um, very safe um, for the most part. And um, school is somewhere where um, I enjoy meeting up with my friends and learning about the world. Um, and I really enjoy school and I think you'd really love school here. Do you have a message for the kids that, that watch CBC Kids News? You guys are very fortunate. You are you guys are very lucky that in that um, you are in Canada in a real pretty good place that you are steady and living. So be proud of yourself. This is our Vancouver. Coming up, the very real connection between exercise and mental health. Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. So last week, gyms and fitness centers opened again in BC. They've been closed for weeks under the latest pandemic restrictions. And while the industry argued they were essential to help improve mental health, researchers are finding it's not necessary to leave home to get benefit. Kurt Petrovich explains. Bernie Maroney has a history of depression in his family. Take a breath in. Yoga helps him stay positive, but when the pandemic hit, he had nowhere to go. And I was going to hot yoga, and it's very hard to replicate that in a home. 
and I tried and it failed rather miserably. That's when Maroney volunteered for a study that gave him a commercial fitness app for free in exchange for having his mood measured through weekly questionnaires. And you just choose how many minutes you want to do and you press start. The study built on decades of evidence showing depression symptoms can be eased by exercise. Timely research as the pandemic took a toll on mental health. It was really just broadly across the whole community people were suffering. So we wanted to see whether we can support people. Those doing both yoga and high intensity exercise reported the biggest improvement. 72% of the ones who were like could be categorized as having high depression at the start were by six weeks were now below that level. That's quite significant. There's been enough studies. There is absolutely no question, no question at all. This psychiatrist has seen exercise work in real time. You start to get yourself into a regular routine. You start to get out and be outside and doing things. He says exercise can influence brain chemistry. And he began prescribing exercise to his patients eight years ago. Let's start with a, a nice easy warm up. Those prescriptions became a formal rotation. program called Jump Step. It's led by a former patient who says exercise helped. So when you're depressed, your mind is so busy with negative thoughts and chatter. And when you kind of take yourself out of your mind and into your body doing physical things, you know, you get a break from all that chatter and it is a good feeling. And step on the tubing. The BC government has also a good feeling about it. It's looking at making Jump Step a province-wide program. Kurt Petrovich, CBC News, Vancouver. I'm George. I'm Janet. And this, this is, is our Vancouver. Vancouver. Kurt, thank you so much for that. Now, our Vancouver is going to be taking a break during the Beijing Olympic Games, so we thought we would leave you with this story done by our own Justin McElroy. He is one of Vancouver's most influential people, according to the annual list compiled by Vancouver Magazine, and he is just a great storyteller. So here's Justin with a story on how the 2010 Olympics changed Whistler and Vancouver forever. It's the 10th anniversary of the 2010 Winter Olympics, and you're going to be hearing a lot about legacy this and legacy that. But what is the best way of exploring a legacy? Is it by talking to people or reading reports? I say it's visiting every single Olympic legacy. A couple of ground rules. We're only going to include things in the cities that hosted Olympic events. And we're only going to include physical things that are still there that were built pretty much directly because of the games. Of course, Vancouver is unique because there were so few new buildings constructed for the Olympics, but there were some, like the Hillcrest Center for Curling, the Doug Mitchell Winter Thunderbird Sports Center for Hockey. Of course, the Olympic Village was an entire residential neighborhood created from the games. We also got the refurbished ice rink at Robson Square. And we've got the new convention center different from the old convention center. But the place where the Olympics probably had the biggest legacy was in Whistler, where all the outdoor events were held. Part of that was the venues, the Olympic Park for ski jumping, biathlon and cross country skiing, and the sliding center for bobsleigh, luge and skeleton. The biggest impact to Whistler though may have been the athlete center and Olympic village built south of the municipality in Chequemus Creek. The reason? After the Olympics, the entire area was given to the municipality. Whistler has been very focused on non-market housing. That piece of land allowed us to make a huge jump forward as far as the provision of that employee housing. The Athletes Village has allowed us to continue to house uh, our community in Whistler. But we've also got a few quirky legacy projects by other groups to tick off as well. Like this basketball court in East Van that only exists because Coca-Cola spent $350,000 on it for an Olympic legacy. Or specially built playgrounds in Richmond, Vancouver, and Whistler. Also in Whistler, there's this passive house built by and for Austria for the games and a driving range that was expanded and upgraded after it was converted into a parking lot for the games. And that's it. Every single physical piece of infrastructure legacy from the 2010, the artwork. We forgot about the artwork. 
And while we may not think of it the same way, a lot of the physical legacy of the games can be found in art commission for it. In Vancouver alone, some have already become iconic, like the East Vancouver sign, the Olympic Village Burbs, and the Olympic Torch itself. But there's also smaller exhibits that still dot the city, like the words don't fit the picture display, aerodynamic forms in space, or the Nike statue, given to us by Greece in 2009, but only installed here in 2017 for some reason. We've also got smaller artwork in Olympic Village, more in Olympic Village, Trout Lake, Killarney Center, Hillcrest Park, displays inside Killarney Community Center, even these three strange lights at Kingsway and Knight, an Olympic legacy project. But the smallest Olympic legacy might be under the Canby Street Bridge. It was there in 2010 that a giant sculpture was built that would change colors throughout the night. That sculpture is long gone, but the podium built for it, still here. And those are all the legacies of the 2010 Olympics from the very big to the very small. For CBC News, I'm Justin McElroy. You've probably noticed more and more people using N95 and KN95 masks. These are respirators that create a seal around your face, providing even more protection against the Omicron variant. If you do choose to wear one of these masks, here's what you need to know about how to wear and care for it. In the hospital environment and in healthcare environments, we do what's called fit testing. In other words, we verify through um, um, a procedure that that mask fits your face, that it provides effective enough seal, that the breathing is going through the mask and therefore living up to its efficiency of 95% reduction in the inspiration of particles of a certain size. If it's not fit tested, uh, and particularly people have different shapes and sizes to their face, then the mask is not really meeting that 95% efficiency target. The Public Health Agency of Canada says you can still wear these masks even if they haven't been professionally fitted. The trick is to mold it to the shape of your face in order to create a seal. Now one way of testing how well you did is to blow into the mask if you can feel air coming out the top or if your glasses are fogging up, it's a sign that you haven't sealed it properly. Normally these masks are not intended to be worn more than one time, but that advice has now changed because so many people are wearing them so often. And unlike cloth masks, you can't wash them. So after you wear them one time, you should store them somewhere safe for at least a week or hang them up somewhere dry, and no single mask should be used more than 10 times. If you can't get an N95 mask, wearing a normal cloth mask over a medical mask will still provide you with good protection. The most important thing is to find a mask that fits your face well and that you can wear consistently. When we bring you stories here at CBC Vancouver, we have award-winning photographers out capturing the images that say so much. Now, still images add context and they bring a lot more to the understanding of an event or an issue. So here are some of the latest from what happened this past week. And that's all for our Vancouver for this week. I hope you can join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio 1 for On the Coast. Goodbye for now.